Good evening, everyone. Time for episode 19 of Kerr's Rage, part one of the Dwyer Team Staff Saga by me. Uh, today we're starting off on page 201. The party of adventurers is on their way to Nordtown Village, and they've encamped on a promontory overlooking, uh, in the distance, the village itself. Okay. And again on page 201, where we left off in the previous episode. <clears throat> when the curtain of night had fallen, Nordtown became visible. It appeared like an orange beacon it to the north, for it had been put to flame. Small figures could be seen flitting about through the light and smoke. They were the victorious orcs finishing their plunder of the defenseless town. The works of men are so fragile, Leander said thoughtfully. I think that the gods put what magic men possess in their hands, Dartin said. Our hopes and dreams live and die by what we create. Tarek concealed their campfire by building it beneath the lip of the crag. That way, enemies watching from below would see none of its light. They had to feed their horses the precious grain that had been packed for them, for there was no grass upon the stony precipice. They ate and watched the terrible scene below them. It was such a bitter defeat and so horrible of a tragedy that they would find little sleep this night. Kalor set up his small tent in a sheltered nook, unpacking two candles, his small mirror, in his book of shadows which contained all his spell formulas and incantations, he prepared to further study the necklace. Pulling out his special quartz crystal that he kept on a cord about his neck, he readied it. He would need it to cast his spell of reading, which would allow him to understand its inscriptions. Unrolling the parchment upon which he'd scribed the runes that he'd seen, he invoked the spell of reading and understanding. He tried the incantation once and then again, but both times he was confounded. The symbols became blurry beneath his sorcerer's gaze. While his spell remained active, he again used his mirror to view the band and found that its gem was glowing as it had done before. He strove again to read its symbols, but try as he might, their meaning remained a mystery. Some powerful warding magic protected it. Perhaps it was cursed, as Carmen said. How then was he to get it off? He tried not to panic, but anxiety welled up within him. He tried to. Take his mind off his situation by studying a few simple incantations, but his thoughts were jumbled, and his spell's formula eluded his understanding. He was unaware of falling asleep. The long, hard road had taxed his body, and it demanded rest. He vaguely remembered seeing those terrible, red-rimmed eyes drawing him ever closer. The Red Dragon Brigade The Red Dragons were some of Lord Cherrick's most elite soldiers. Two full companies of them were stationed at Nordtown, because the village was settled on the edge of the wild lands of the north and was therefore vulnerable. When the threat of orc raiding parties became great enough, Baron Dutchings had hired nearly a hundred mercenaries to defend the town. Within a week, it became clear that the orc's primary objective was the town itself, and then the Baron used all the forces under his command to fortify the town, and he sent for reinforcements. The Baron was a small, wiry man, whose stature went far beyond his physical height. Coming from a wealthy family, he served as an officer with the 3rd Mountain Brigade and later arrived in the valley to settle its lands. Nordtown Village was his creation, and it had grown into a blossoming town. The lands of the valley were rich and fertile, and his farms were among the best producers in safe haven. The people who had founded the settlement with him had done it with determination and endless grit. Their valley was as much a part of them as they were of it, and that's why most of them refused to give up an inch of ground to the invading orcs. Toward the end, the Baron had given leave to all his subjects, 
Go while you can. There's no need to stay here and lose your lives. But none of them heeded his words. This was their home, and they weren't leaving. He'd sent several runners to the south and west requesting reinforcements, but that was just two days before the orcs attacked. They attacked with such might and surprise that they overran his defenses in the first few moments of battle. After that, it became a fierce struggle, fighting from building to building, upon rooftops and over every roadway. He knew that their defeat was inevitable. The Red Orcs were more organized than he had ever seen them. Launching an early morning attack in the twilight moments before dawn, they'd cover more than half of the distance between the forest and their defenses before the warning battle horn was sounded. Their strategy had foiled the night vision of his Lyosalfar sentries and given the orcs the element of surprise. His defending archers had felled many of the invaders, and his slingers, hurtling balls of iron, had claimed many more casualties. But the orcs had great round shields, and most of them made it to the outskirts of their ramshackle fortifications safely. <clears throat> Even more horrifying than the orcs were, were the giants that walked among them. So mighty were they that they wielded tree-trunk clubs, and Nordtown's defensive walls were no match for them. Neither stone wall nor overturned wagon could hold them back, and the orcs and their war dogs rushed in behind them. It was then that the fighting became the most fierce. Man fought against orc, elf against mastiff, and the red dragon's horn of battle sounded many times to rally them. But slowly, inexorably, the orc's superior numbers began to prevail, and many brave soldiers died as heroes that day. Archers firing from rooftops slew many an orc, but the buildings were made mostly from wood and thatch and once they'd thrown any valuables that they found within them into the streets, the orcs were quick to ignite them. The fighting waged on for hours, each side taking heavy casualties, but the orcs were greater in numbers by at least ten score, and Nordtown's valiant heroes fell one after another. Of the three giants that came to do battle, the red dragons brought down only one, but the orcs' dogs had been the first to join the fight and many of them had been killed. But despite the Baron's small victories, the men were inevitably driven back and into the town's center. He hoped that some small group of fighters might have been able to escape the ever-tightening noose of the orcs. In the end, they had no choice but to join their comrades in the great church. Its walls were of stone, and its frame was of oak. It was the strongest building in the village, Leading their defenses from within, his last remaining archers fired what arrows they could out of its shattered stained glass windows. This is uh, this section is my uh, fantasy rendition of the Battle of Mogadishu. Uh, anyway, that was my uh, inspiration when I was in the service. I started writing uh, this story. That Battle of Mogadishu was was largely in my mind when I started this this story. Okay. In the end, they had no choice but to join their comrades in the great church. Its walls were of stone and its frame was of oak. It was the strongest building in the village. Leading their defenses from within, his last remaining archers fired what arrows they could out of its shattered stained glass windows. His knights defended the entrances valiantly, but the enemy's numbers were just too great, and in the end, they fell one by one. Once the main doors had been breached, the orcs rushed in, and his knights could not defend against their awesome rush. Many of them were mercilessly beaten even beyond death, but a dark figure commanded them to halt at the last, and a few survivors were taken alive. The women, children, and Baron Dutchings were all chained together, the orcs' commander forced them to watch as they pillaged the town. Their home, which had taken their lifetimes to build, was destroyed. The captured could hope for nothing save for a life of slavery and harrowing toil. Many of them despaired and threw their lives away upon the slave master's knives. 
But the orcs were swift to dole out their cruel justice with hard blows and cat and nine tails, and overall they lost very few prisoners. He, their Dutchings, had failed them all. It was a great victory for the orcs. The shamans had laid a curse upon the town that would bring fear to the hearts of their enemies. Their wagons were filled with gold, silver, and valuable supplies, and they had many fine slaves. But to their leader it was no victory, for his commander desired a single item alone, and he had not found it. His name was Lysurgis, which meant wolf driver in the tongue of the dark Alfar, and he was a master of spies. He had scoured the lands for miles around and knew that the item was close at hand. He'd felt sure that he'd find it among his defeated enemies or hidden within the town. But somehow he'd been wrong, and all that he had proven was the superiority of his army over that of an outnumbered foe. It was a victory for Dragonia and a good test of their new ally's strength, but woe to him when he made his report to Vlad. His anger was terrible, but the orcs would not understand his loss of honor. His position demanded their respect, so he let them pillage. He let them burn. <clears throat> the demon, Rol the Armagebnom. Trapped within the extra-dimensional prison of Kalor's necklace was the very angry pit fiend, Daemon Raul the Armagebnon. He had been imprisoned within its magical confines for a millennium, and in that time it had been passed between owners for generations. None of them had possessed the skills necessary for unlocking the secret of its true power, that is, until now. In a handful of days, this one small gnome had nearly unlocked its key, and in so doing, he had nearly been freed. But in his long captivity, Rawl's patience had long since departed, and he realized that he would have to possess the gnome in order to secure his freedom. His imprisonment had fueled his hatred and his rage. His obsession for revenge against the one who had trapped him here burned within his heart like an erupting volcano. And as the gnome grew closer to discovering the necklace's command words, he exerted his considerable will and invaded Kalor's dreams. The gnome was mentally strong, however, and it took all of his demonic skill to win out against his natural defenses. He had entered his dreams subtly as first, but now the moment of his freedom was at hand and he could wait no longer. And so, when the gnome slept, his exhausted sleep, he invaded his fatigued mind and gripped it with the burning talons of his will. Kalor awoke possessed. Within himself, he was aware of the demon's presence, but in his terror he could do nothing, for his body was no longer his to command. He rose and he spoke and the words that left his mouth were not his own. What issued forth from his lips was the commanding voice of a demon, and his words were his freedom. Ili Adamus Enua is apertus gradus forus captivus. And then the demon's great roar woke them all, and when they saw Kalor standing with horrible countenance, fear gripped them, and none of them could act for he stood near the edge of the promontory holding his arms above him in a posture of ecstatic power. His features were sinister, and his eyes bulged with evil desire. The veins stood out from his neck as if he was straining to lift a great weight, and the starfire gem at his throat glowed with a white-hot radiance. His companions could do nothing to help him. All that they could do was cringe in terror as the necklace released its prisoner. The pit fiend was well over fifteen feet tall, and his enormous body dwarfed the tiny gnome at his feet. His very sweat was burning oil, his fangs were black daggers, and his eyes were pupilless orbs of anger. And wherever his body touched the earth, smoking prints were left, and where his vile salvations fell, craters were burned. He stood before them all in freedom, and their lives danced in the palms of his hands. Stretching his clawed hands to the sky, he looked at the stars with red-rimmed eyes crying out in victory, I am free! 
and the very air crackled beneath the power of his words, and no mortals yet lived who would have remembered hearing that terrible voice. And then he returned his attention again upon the mere mortals before him, and he stared down upon the gnome who had granted him his freedom. I waited in that prison for a thousand years, and only you possess the strength to free me, and for that I will spare you. Farewell, little gnome. Perhaps we will meet again. And then he raised his hands before him and spoke in the tongue of demon kind. And lo, the very air about them crackled with electricity, and fire and brimstone issued forth from a great portal before him. And when it was completely formed, he stepped into his burning hell, and the companions heard him speak once more before he was gone. Now, Daemon Karatul Zinon, you will bow again before me, for my rage has grown for a thousand years. And then he and his portal were gone, and all that remained was a little smoke and the smell of ozone. And where he had strode, the stone was pitted and smoldering. And all who looked upon the tracks knew that those remnants of the demon's passing would remain until the very mountain was worn away by time. Kalor could do nothing but lie still, clutching his throat. The demon's possession was a desecration of his soul, and he swore that one day he would have his own revenge. Is he gone? Carmen said fearfully, only now daring to rise from her bedroll. So it would appear, Tarek said as he climbed down from his lookout although I hope that we never meet him again. May Moradeus make it so, Kerr prayed, although he was rarely one to pray. And Odin as well, Dartin said, may his strength protect us. I think that we are indeed small fish, Leander said, to a being with such power. But could we possible, possibly possess that one such as he could covet? Our souls, Common answered patting her sword hilt reassuringly, but not so long as we keep our faith. I hope that faith is enough, Kalor said, fearful that the voice that he would utter would not be his own, and grateful that he's gone. I feel as though a tremendous burden has been lifted from me. Never will I forget the words that he spoke to me. Then I will name this place Demon's Mercy, Leander said, and they all agreed that he had a fine gift for naming things. Late indeed. Evening turned to night, but my audience was still attentive. I had their full attention, despite the fact that the midnight hour would soon pass and bring us into morning. I had come to an important part in my story, when our adventure began to intertwine with the efforts of our enemies as yet unknown to us. I had to explain the history carefully. The motivations of our opponents would not be known to us until later in our quest, even I didn't put all the events together until I was a captive in the Great Pyramid of the Orcs. Did you ever meet the demon again, Kalor? It sounds impossible, Sonya said, that a demon could be held captive within a simple necklace. And if we were to travel through the Highland Pass, would we find demon's mercy as you've described it? Is the necklace in your story, Eric asked, the same as the one that you wear now? It did, and it is indeed, as far as I know, the demon's footprints still remain in the rocks of Highland Pass. But I want to know... <clears throat> excuse me. What I want to know, Garrett asked, is why the orcs raided the city after two hundred years of peace. They had to be looking for something besides the spoils of war. We were confused by the sudden attack of the tribes. Never before had they joined together for a single purpose. That was a jackal tactic. Maybe some other force was driving them. All we knew then was that a terrible massacre had occurred. We didn't find out why it happened until much later. Will you tell us, Polly asked, before the night is through? I will tell you all that I can, but remember that we had no knowledge at the time of what I am going to tell you now. Just believe me when I say that it's necessary that I show the story to you in this way for all to understand. And although Sonya was skeptical, she remained among us. With the smoke of my pipe, I conjured an illusion of the orc's great army, and I moved them toward the largest tent on the plain. It was the dwelling of their leader, a dark alpha sorcerer, a 
of terrible power. And that's where we will begin episode 20 with the chapter entitled Lysurgis on page 212. Thank you for listening. Have a great night. And as always, remember to read Kerr's Rage, part one of the Dwarred Heemstaff Saga, by me in all of its following novels. Thank you and have a great night.